Hi, I'm Leonard Lee, Managing Director and Founder of NextCurve, and I'm here at the Qualcomm headquarters in San Diego, California, and I'm joined here today uh, with uh, Kirti Gupta and Don McGuire. And we're going to be talking about the digital divide, right? And more specifically, digital divide plus 5G, what does it mean, what are the opportunities, and um, what are some of the things that we can expect going forward in terms of some opportunities to bridge that digital divide. So, hey, it's great to be here. Hey, in, Leonard. Yeah, in the headquarters with both of you. Great to be here too. Yeah, and, and so, um, Hey, let's talk about this topic of digital divide, why don't we? I wanted to ask uh, both of you, I mean, what is the digital divide? What does it mean to Qualcomm? And uh, what, what are some of your initial perspectives on, on the uh, challenges and the opportunities here? Sure, I'll, I'll give it a shot to start. Um, in order for, you know, for us to collectively realize our vision for a world that's where everyone and everything can be intelligently connected, you kind of have to add that everywhere in there, right? Because today, where you're physically located could be the difference between are you connected or are you not? Mm -hmm. And that's where this inequality comes in, right? right. Um, and so as digitization accelerates and more and more innovation happens with the digital economy, et cetera, the, the divide widens if you don't solve that fundamental issue of providing the ubiquitous infrastructure mm -hmm. to enable everybody to take advantage of that or have access to connectivity so they could participate in that digital economy. So it's important that we work to close the digital divide or else as innovation and technology continues to evolve, um, people, more and more people are going to be left behind. Right. And Leonard, you know, at Qualcomm we work on so many sophisticated technologies. We started working yeah. on 2G then 3G, 4G, now 5G, V or fifth generation wireless, we call them Gs in our world. Mm -hmm. There are such sophisticated technologies in, you know, from 2G to 4G, we have reached a point where we are streaming videos online and uploading, you know, gigabytes of data. And with 5G, we are talking, as Don said, about connecting everything everywhere. But the reality is we still live in a world where 37% of the world is not digitally connected. We live in a world where that digital divide is exaggerated in rural areas, in underserved areas, among women, among older population, in you know, socioeconomic groups that are less served. So they are disproportionately not benefiting from these incredible technologies. So we are really excited. I think this is one of the great things about working in a place like this, on technologies like yeah. this, that you're actually bringing access and affordability to close that digital divide once and for all with 5G. You know, one of the things that I, I did notice, I mean, I know that you guys worked on, a, you releasing a study, and some of the, um, the results of the study were pretty astonishing. I mean, when you, we look at, you, you brought up the 37%, yeah. right? I mean, that's the disparity between low income uh, countries versus, let's say, advanced um, or high income countries. That disparity is very, very, large, right? And so even in San Diego, there's certain areas where I would say, hey, look, we're a little <laughs> bit underserved in this particular My house. area. <laughs> okay, there you go. Yes, but, I am part of the digital divide. Right, yeah, always part of the digital divide. Right. <laughs> so that tells you the extent of the problem. Yeah, Absolutely. and I'll tell you, one. My, my condo is in the digital divide. So, I mean, there's opportunities there even to enhance the experience and connect people even in what you would call uh, the higher income countries, right? Yeah, I mean, I think um, what you're getting to really is what is it the opportunity, yeah. and then how can you know technologies like 5G, which Kirti mentioned, all the generations that we've been through, how can that help to bridge the situation that we're in? And you mentioned the digital divide doesn't just exist in sub-Saharan Africa or even in rural Iowa, right? Yeah. It exists in our own backyard, mm -hmm. and there's lots of different layers to that equation to solve that. But the exciting thing about 5G and, and the underlying technology um, that we've worked so hard for years and years to commercialize and develop and then deploy with our partners and our ecosystems is that it can accelerate the closure of that divide. Mm -hmm. Because 5G in its nature is a unifying connectivity fabric. Right. And if deployed right in the right way, in the most ubiquitous manner possible with the support from regulators mm -hmm. and from the ecosystem of, of technology partners mm -hmm. um, and from local governments and from enterprises and businesses, it can actually help to bridge that divide and be as ubiquitous as 
electricity is, for example. So homes, schools, businesses, small businesses, large, you know, large businesses, institutions, right, could leverage 5G to actually bridge some of those connectivity issues because the biggest issue is access to broadband, right? And when you have fixed broadband access only able to go so far because of legacy infrastructure, because of the lack of fiber, the economic model for fixed broadband providers to not provide Wire, you know, wired last mile anymore, right? This is where 5G can really step in and provide that wireless last mile in a very right. cost-effective way to bridge that divide and provide that level of broadband connectivity hmm. to a broader population or swath of the population. So the opportunity for 5G is really, really great to be able to, you know, sort of help us bridge the divide, you know, with help from, from the entire equation, but it is that fabric that could really do a lot to kind of close that gap. And we're going to talk about some specific areas sure. that are really exciting in right. a minute. But right. that's sort of my perspective. OK. Yeah. yeah. And that's why we wrote this report that you mentioned, right, Leonard? I mean, we were really trying to address what is the size of this opportunity and mm -hmm. where is it that 5G can actually help in bridging the divide. So I mentioned that 37%, and you know, Don is right. That 37% encompasses not just rural or s suburban areas or you know developing countries it's a lot of places that are places in you know like in our backyard like your mm -hmm. house and that last mile problem is a real problem regulatory hurdles mm -hmm. where you can have a much higher cost advantage mm -hmm. by creating a wireless backhaul or the wireless last mile over other options like fiber Mm -hmm. Like we're talking about 70, 80 percent cheaper in circle, certain circumstances for the same amount of data traffic. So for the same bang for the buck, you're paying a third of the cost. That completely changes the cost equation for service providers mm -hmm. and therefore for users. Mm -hmm. And that's where you can see massive improvement. OK. And, you know, I want to step back a bit and have you guys talk about the the why uh, you know going back to the why do should we bridge the digital divide in terms of impact okay what sort of impact do you feel that it can have and you know I, I'd like to take you back to like uh, when uh, the offset of the pandemic where I, I think the whole world came to a realization that hey we have a problem you know we have huge um, portions of our populations, whether it's in uh, developing countries or in advanced countries, where children were not connected, they could not learn, right? And I, I think this is something that we all empathized with as we were going through the pandemic. What, I mean, let's talk a little bit about that. Okay, so, you know, you're right. The pandemic really highlighted some of those areas where you need to s solve this digital divide issue to provide access to education, healthcare, things like that, right? So remote education. And also, the pandemic created an opportunity for society where things that would have taken maybe 10 or 20 years to become socially acceptable are totally socially acceptable now. Working remotely, remote education, telehealth, huge, right? So in a country like India, for example, there are like three doctors for every thousand people in the population, mm -hmm. even lower number when it comes to rural, rural areas. Imagine with access to telehealth, how that changes, transforms, revolutionizes completely. So just solving that, you know, digital divide issue, bringing broadband in rural areas can provide healthcare access to these large swaths of population like never before. Mm. Not to mention, you know, other benefits like education, work, skilling, training for new jobs and so on that are massive social changes. Mm. So I think, you know, like if you want to really divide the overall impact though, taking a step back from the users, it's the users themselves, then it's service providers who, are, who now have a totally different cost benefit story because of the massively reduced cost to access. Right. And then it is public utility providers, mm -hmm. right? So all three have a stake in this game now. And then zooming out a little bit further from a macroeconomic perspective, the technology is now here. So the potential of the technology is to bring 850 million people out of the digital divide and connected mm -hmm. to the world. That translates into 2.5% 
of additional GDP over the next 10 years, which translates to $3.3 trillion of added GDP over the next decade. So this is a pretty massive, I would say, social contribution of a technology that is designed to increase access and increase affordability. So Don, I think this is about time we introduce that term, this unique term that Alex Katuzian introduced at Snapdragon Summit 2022, and it is? Incredology. <laughs> yes, the opportunity uh, to deliver incredology to close the digital divide is immense. Um, and I wanted to build on what Kirti said, you know, the, the pandemic was the kerosene poured on the gas fire that it was the digital divide, right? Um, because it was, there was awareness, um, there was maybe not some acceptance, but there was awareness that it existed. Um, but it really, it really ripped the Band-Aid off. Um, because again, it highlighted, um, you know, 35 to 40% of the Los Angeles Unified School District's children did not have access to remote school because they did not have access to broadband connectivity. Um, small businesses who were amongst the most hurt section of the economy during yeah. the pandemic yeah. were mostly used to analog first operations and not mobile or digital first operations. How could they survive during the pandemic when no one could physically come to their store and they couldn't physically do business in a physical manner? And then you have you know, access to healthcare if you had a problem, access to emergency services, Heck, just staying connected to friends and family, right? Which you couldn't do physically anymore during certain lockdown situations. So, the 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 importance of connectivity um, was it, you know was never more highlighted. And then the problem that it's not ubiquitous was never more highlighted than it, during the pandemic. So what Curtis is saying about the opportunity to move the world forward from an economic development perspective, you know, trillions in economic development, right, um, is is amazing. And I think that this the, the pandemic in its unfortunate circumstance has been an accelerant to really getting us closer to realizing that 850 million more people connected, you know, improves economies, lifts societies, and kind of puts everybody on a more equal footing going forward as the digital economy continues to explode and we continue to do things in our lives differently than we did them prior to the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, and I'm glad that you brought up uh, the small business situation because I think that was really, really challenging. When we talk about digital divide, we one of the things that I don't think we talk about much is this idea of resiliency. Is when in situations of crisis or even just you know as we look at um, you know day to day, I mean things happen, right? How resilient is our infrastructure and its ability to support and sustain businesses, learning, and all of that. And um, you know, earlier we talked about how there's these two flavors of the digital divide, right? And um, wanted to, uh, in the context of 5G, and in particular FWA, how does that bring benefit or address these two scenarios? And maybe you can share your perspectives on that. I'd, I'd be really interested in hearing what they are, so. Sure, I mean, I, I think, you know, we talked about the problem being multi, you know, like an equation that has like multi piece, multiple pieces to it. Um, uh, and you have to kind of clear those pieces to have the right recipe. And you mentioned Geo earlier, and, and, and what I'm really excited about about what India is doing is, it's, it's this great partnership between the Indian government in clearing the hurdles, right, regulatory, from a regulatory perspective, um, creating the right spectrum policy to allow the operators to buy high band, mid band, low band, mix the three together to deliver the right solutions. And then it's Geo's capabilities to you know, light up 100 different, you know, 100,000 or 100 million, 100 million, 100 million yeah. different um, sites to really provide that footprint and that scale to connect, you know, a great portion or a good portion of that 850 million unconnected. Um, but they're coming from a more of a greenfield approach where they don't have legacy wired infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? So, so creating that recipe or getting that recipe right is, is a little bit easier because um, you still have to make the right decisions, but you're not dealing with a lot of legacy stuff. In the U.S., we have a different set of issues, right? We're dealing with legacy wired infrastructure structure, we're dealing with players in the ecosystem that have are used to making their economic models work based on that legacy wired infrastructure. So it's almost like an evolution 
uh, it's an evolutionary shift that has to happen within the ecosystem. And then we also have to add on the right spectrum policy and all that type of stuff in order for us to be able to clear the decks so that solutions like FWA can actually be deployed at scale. I think T-Mobile has done a really good job of showing how it can be done. Um, Kurt, you mentioned US Cellular, and they're doing some really cool stuff in, in some underserved markets. But T-Mobile, with over 1.4 million you know, broadband, T-Mobile broadband subscribers, is delivering high-speed, ultra-reliable, low-latency broadband to homes at a very affordable price. Really, you know, cutting into that underserved, right, that, that divide issue economically, right, and from a technology perspective through FWA. And because, you know, and like I said before, we're really happy to be part of that solution from a device hardware perspective all the way back to an infrastructure perspective through some of the, the solutions that we have and we've announced. Um, and so I think that's, that's part of this, of, of fixing this globally is, understanding regionally what the issues are, and then you know, fil forming that recipe for success, and then you know, crossing off those, those barriers, or those hurdles one by one, so that you can actually deploy the technology solutions that then the end user is gonna benefit from, um, which is the other side of the coin. Yeah, right? yeah. So. and um, so I wanna react to what you just shared. Um, I think you know, one of the things that we as analysts have been searching for is this 5G killer app. And quite honestly, I mean, I think this is the FWA, 5G FWA is probably as close to that as you can probably get. I mean, you mentioned T-Mobile. It, 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 it's a great way for operators to take advantage of their existing um, assets or the assets that they're investing in and creating new revenue streams, right? And so if we really think about it in terms of what a killer app is, I mean, it, it's gonna create new revenue opportunities and you're going to get a return off of it, right? But Kurti, uh, let's talk about really quickly and maybe we cap off our discussion with uh, I mean, what has to happen. I mean, when we look at these two different flavors of uh, the digital divide problem and bringing FWA in to solve them and bridge the divide, what are some of those things that, that need to happen? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. you know, as an economist, I would say, show me the incentives and I will tell you what the outcome is. It's all about incentives <laughs> which we need to create. Mm -hmm. So, let's take the India example that Don mentioned, right? In an environment where we have a greenfield approach, there is a natural incentive to be able to provide the right regulatory spectrum and technology framework to invest in bringing 5G fixed wireless access to the population to connect from the digital divide, to come out of the digital divide. When we have existing legacy hurdles, we need to work a little extra hard to create the right incentives. And the good news right now is that there is, you know, the US government, the federal government has uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, right, recently. So we are, as a society, thinking of investing in infrastructure in the future. Mm -hmm. In that, we need to be careful in how we define what mobile broadband looks like. We shouldn't subscribe to, for example, narrow definitions like under 100 megabits per second is what broadband is, which unnaturally incentivizes certain technology solutions and disincentivize others. We need to have a broad and a neutral approach that enables the right or the most economically efficient technology solutions to be brought to bear to close the digital divide, which does exist as a real thing in the US, both in urban, rural, and suburban societies, right, and in, in all different flavors. So uh, I would say, you know, let's create the right incentives for deployment of the right technology solutions uh, in different areas, depending on what the issue is, and the solutions will come and the investment will come. Wonderful. So, hey, you know what? Um, it's been a pleasure to talk to both of you about this really important topic, and we'll have to do it again sometime soon. Thanks for having us. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Leonard. Thanks.